Well, welcome everyone. We'll get started with introductions as, as folks start to dial in. My name is Priscilla Phillips. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and Annual Giving at Golden Gate University, and I'm really excited to introduce Marsha Rubin. Dr. Marsha Rubin is an Associate Professor and Program Director for Golden Gate University's Master's in Leadership Program. She was also the 2016-2018 Russell T. Sharp Research Professor, focusing on neuroscience, leadership, and complexity. In addition to her responsibilities at Golden Gate University, she also maintains a private executive leadership development practice. And with that, I'd like to introduce Marsha. Hi, everyone. It's uh, great to see all of you. Um, although I think your faces, I guess you'll stay on the screen. At any rate, it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Robert Patterson, who's really our special guest here today. And thanks to Robert for being here. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Robert. He's a very proud alumni of Golden Gate University's Master's in Taxation. Uh, he uh, graduated with his master's in 2004 and has had quite a, an amazing uh, uh, career as a tax practitioner, which we'll be talking about. Uh, right now, he's working at Microsoft. He serves as a Microsoft director, and he ensures internal control over financial reporting across all functional tax and trade area. So he's got a really big job. Um, previously, Robert worked on initiative uh, related to global and uh, domestic tax compliance and policies with the big four accounting firms, multinational companies uh, like Walmart and American Express. And he also worked for the state of Kansas, where he helped uh, draft tax legislation. Um, throughout his career, Robert has taken some very bold risks uh, that sometimes raised eyebrows, but he really, that allowed him to carve a really unique path. Uh, one of the most interesting things about, of many about Robert is that he takes his inspiration from his parents who moved their family from post-segregation Alabama to Alaska following his mother's participation in the Selma, um, Alabama's Bloody Sunday protest. Um, and, and after she enrolled in the Alabama Community College amid, amid aggressive discrimination. So uh, these values of determination, diligence, and preparation have served Robert well. And, and I'm gonna ask him a little bit about, how his, about his mom as well. Um, so Robert has earned a number of degrees. He has a, a Bachelor of Business Administration and Finance from Pacific Lutheran University. And he's earned an MBA in finance and accounting from Moorhead State University, a Master of Science in Operations Management from the University of Arkansas, a Master of Science in Taxation, of course, from here at Golden Gate University. And uh, to top that all off, he has a graduate certificate in state and local taxation from the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Um, he's also completed coursework in law at Washburn University School of Law. So he's a real, a, a very voracious learner. Um, and he's also quite an amazing networker, which we'll also talk about. So let's go ahead and start. Um, Robert, <clears throat> Robert, why don't you tell us what drew you into the tax field and to Golden Gate University? Oh, well, thank you for that, Dr. Rubin. I think that was a tremendous overview. Uh, and easily, I can say uh, it, it's been a pragmatic career that I've kind of I've been sort of about my approach and, and how I manage myself. So after I graduated with my undergrad, taxation was not in uh, was not necessarily a focus or a career sort of path that I actually would say I identified with. Uh, but one of the internships I did that led up sort of that year when I graduated was I worked at this company called Merrill Lynch. Years later, I actually worked on the, uh, the merger of Merrill Lynch and Bank of America. But then it was the sort of investment banking house where I had the opportunity to kind of look and work in sort of the industry and learn about sort of investment banking. And one of the unique aspects of it was this, as I sat there and did the work, I said, you know, long term, this doesn't have a fulfilling element to it. It has something much more of a, a very sort of rhythmic approach. And one of the things that caught my sort of attention as finance professionals is we look at fees because, you know, you want to grow revenue and that's one stream. But then I look at the amount of expense that we were kind of offsetting that with. And so we would get this stack of sort of invoices and notices each month. And each month I'd notice these four names that would show up. And many of you who work in the fields probably have a feeling of these names. But I'd see a PricewaterhouseCoopers LLP. I'd see a Deloitte & Touche. I'd see a KPMG and I'd see an Ernst & Young. And next to them would be 
significant volumes of fees, anything ranging from 15 million to 40 million. And, you know, these things happen with regular occurrence. And so as I sat there, I would go, you know, I've, I got to write this down because this is interesting to me. I noticed we're paying significance out in tax fees. The, the, the person I reported to asked the query. And he said, you know, we have a tax department at Merrill. And here, let me put you in touch with that individual. So I go in, I talk to the individual. And I said, you know, I, I, what really prompted this conversation was just me noticing the significant amount of tax fees that we were paying out. And I said, all of our disclaimers that we give our consumers, so that's you, I, any of us that receive any kind of notices from these institutions, like a Merrill Lynch, they just say, you know, uh, this is your amount that you need to report on your taxes. It's a 1099 form. And I have this, this caveat that essentially says, uh, please talk to, your, talk to your tax advisor for additional insight. So in my mind, I'm saying, well, for kind of redirecting people on the actual 1099 form we give them the file, but then I see these excessive fees. I was trying to reconcile that. The individual set me down and said, you know, be quite frank, I work in, so he walked down and told me international taxation, gave me a whole sort of spiel. And remember, I'm novice at this point. So when he got done, I just took a lot of notes and feedback. And really what that sort of outcome of that conversation was, if you really want to understand how this works, he mentioned Golden Gate University. Now you got to realize this individual sits in Hopewell, New Jersey. This is where Merrill Lynch does their investment banking program. And he references a Bay Area institution uh, for me to understand about taxation. So of course, trying to reconcile that as well at the time, he said, no, they have an online institution, online program, you can actually learn it, it's effective, a lot of people in the field. And so I took that insight and said, you know what, I'm gonna do some investigative work into this. And so as I started to talk with different individuals and reach out to doing my own sort of diligence, I noticed that Golden Gate really became sort of this premier sort of institution when it came to not only taxation, but also prominent figures working across the corporate sector. And so ultimately that's what led me to Golden Gate University. I actually first enrolled in the, the day tax program, what we call it today the accelerated tax program. But I've actually taken classes post, uh, after finishing the degree, other additional courses just to understand different areas of tax law as well as, and I've done those online as well as the different campuses from San Francisco to Seattle. Okay, great. Well, so tell us about your experience um, in the MSO uh, taxation program mm -hmm. and how that helped your career. And I know when you and I talked before, you also talked about um, what happened at the end and, and how you got connected to uh, the business, your, your first job, your first oh, job. Uh, oh, no, I'm going to tell you about that. Yes, certainly. There's a, a networking piece to it. Right, and, right, right. And so what I'll kind of tell folks is this, is when I started with the day tax program, it was great. Uh, Mary Canning was the dean at the time. She's still a, a professor. She's a dean emeritus today, but still is a professor in the school, so you can still take courses with her. Uh, she uh, did her undergrad and her, her, her law degree in LLM from GGU. Uh, many of the professors there I got to work with were just tremendous. But what really separates, at least now knowledgeable, having also taught in many different institutions, is Golden Gate really emphasizes this key comment, which was day one. Mary Canning got up and talked to this room, it was about 40 of us in the class, and basically said, you know, she finished her law degree and her LLM, which is a, a master's for a, a person with a law degree in taxation, but she didn't know how to complete a 1040 tax return. And so I said, isn't that evidence of the academic experience, <laughs> which is that, you know, oftentimes we learn a lot of theory, but it's that application that actually is sometimes void. Well, she began the institution and the coursework starting with, we're going to learn how to actually use this information and this knowledge so you can actually practically use it immediately. And so when she did that, all of a sudden it became sort of every class was becoming an exercise of conversation. And so with the, for me, that turned into lunchtime, going out, talking with folks across, this is in the Embarcadero area or downtown San Francisco, asking people just queries. And it's so unique. And I think we all can feel this when it comes to taxes. We all have an experience. Tax isn't necessarily something that actually gives us a warm and fuzzy all the time. And so we ask people kind of pull query on, hey, what do you think about this area of tax? You'll notice you get strong reactions. They're like, wow, what is that? Well, and so it actually is good because you get their attention and then you're able to kind of really move into a dialogue and it actually becomes a lot of insight gets delivered. But as the program goes in that second month, or after you finish sort of a first set of courses, they have an internship opportunity that you're already planning for for the spring. 
So there's these uh, interviews. They bring a number of employers, including those four I talked about from our Merrill Lynch experience, so all the big four firms. But you have a host of local firms in the Bay, as well as some pretty prominent corporations actually send their folks there, as well as this institution called the IRS. So all of these employers are in a room. All 40 of us were kind of going through and had the opportunity to kind of engage and, and sort of commence our interview process. And it was so neat because I'm carrying forward the conversation from Dean Canning when I started and said, okay, yes, let's put this to action. Let me explain how this works. After I went through, I went through the entire room, got a lot of good feedback, learned so much from all the recruiters. I sat back to talk to my colleagues and I noticed quite a few of them were just kind of sitting and standing. And I said, oh, this is interesting. Why are you always sitting and standing? And they were like, you know, it's, um, uh, it's kind of hard to really get in there and, and, and explain and, and sh you know, sell themselves. And so I said, uh, you know, this is kind of, you know, adverse to what, what the opportunity is about and why we're here. And this is the sort of also the value of a, an adult institution for learning. As I immediately took each one of those members and I said, you know, I'm going to become your promoter. And I started talking about their accolades. We had individuals from Stanford, uh, Stanford Law, we had Hastings Law, we had folks from Berkeley, just a host of institutions from the Bay and elsewhere. And one individual even had a PhD from the University of Chicago. But with all of those accolades, they couldn't communicate, you know, which is really the, the key to success, and so especially in this endeavor. And so I helped bridge that gap. And in doing so, uh, I got a whole bunch of offer letters. They all got offer letters, which means share success. Everybody's very happy. But then as Dr. Rubin had noted is that when they take you through these interview processes, uh, they're really expansive. So I don't know if everyone's had this experience, so I want to at least give a little light to it. So in the big four, Deloitte took us out on a yacht. A big yacht, take you out into the bay and the water, and they're giving you food, wine, and everything. And you're going, unbelievable. This is, uh, this is how this works, as I'm learning sort of how you entered this big four field. They're like, yes, every day is great. You're going to have a wonderful time. Can't wait for you to join. PwC took us to a golf course. Another one took us up to the Bank of America Tower. Each firm was essentially doing this really good sort of display to lure each person in. And mind you, this is a GGU experience. So I'm sitting here really taking it in, taking notes, but also saying, you know, I don't know if this is practical. It's right around, I'm a pragmatic individual. And so I asked some queries to each one of these firms in these various formats, from the yacht to the golf courses, to the, to the towers, to all these nice forms and settings. And I said, you know, how does this actually work for everyday workers? Where are your actual people that are kind of saying this for five years, just kind of just really working every day and really grinding through it? They were like, oh, they're in the office. And I was like, okay, they're in the office. Do you mind if I could actually go in and meet them? And they all kind of paused and they said, yeah, sure, why not? Go, go, go meet them. And so as I said, okay, this is good. So I actually took them up on that. I went down and all over the, the Bay and went to the offices of all the big four firms and a few of the corporates. And when I went in, you know, not to be surprised, this is, uh, folks were kind of, kind of exhausted. They had put in quite a bit of hours. And uh, I was very fortunate because they still took the time to actually entertain my queries, which were, you know, uh, walk me through, like, if you could do this all over again, what would be different? You know, what were some of your motivations for, for maintaining and continuing your career? So a couple of things came up out of that. One was, you know, they really wanted to understand, you know, experience didn't seem to matter in the, the sort of framework of an organization that size which means that if they had one year of practical tax experience before they started, they wouldn't have come in through sort of this generating engine of, you know, you have to complete sort of these structured sets before being promoted. So some were very focused on promotability and, and how they get there. Others actually were kind of talking about tracks. You know, I kind of came in, I accepted this track that I'm in, because taxation has many levels to it. You know, there's a direct individual individual taxation, which we all experience. There's a corporate taxation. There's multitudes of indirect taxation, like state and local tax, like a VAT or value added tax international. They just came in and accepted the track they were in, and they really wanted to branch out into other tracks. So some were saying, you know, they felt very segmented. And so as I took notes and took all this insight, I said, okay, what I came to the conclusion was that if I were to get an offer, and as I kind of alerted to earlier, I did get them. I said, I'm gonna to have to be very diligent about this. And this is one of those other areas where I think it raised a lot of eyebrows, is they all extended offers. And I told each one of them with uh, great due respect, because that's one thing that matters and you have to be integral. I, that, you know, based on the learnings, this interview is really a two-way street. And I think a lot of people lose sight of that sometimes that I had a lot of insight and inputs that came 
from those discussions that as I reached my inflection point, which was now this moment of accepting the offer or not, I felt fairly comfortable that it would not be in my best interest to start with the big four immediately, but to postpone that for I had another experience with the regional firm to gain a year of experience doing a multitude of tax area type projects. At which time I reached out to a, a CPA firm up in Washington State called Johnson & Shoot and said, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to work there. And so I worked there for a year. And during that time, the big four, to show you how well that worked at the time, uh, not very excited uh, to have a denial. Uh, many of them told me it was a career, you know, whoa, what are you doing? Your career is going, this is that you need to have this experience. Without this, this is career suicide. You have to think about all these different things. It was just kind of, it was really interesting because it really brought out different sets of emotions. And mind you all, careful, I took all of that with, uh, with great insight and awareness because I appreciated that they, uh, that they had that, sen that sentiment, you know, coming through the, the, through the process. And many of the people I got to talk to are also Golden Gate alums. So that actually now we had a connected sort of proposition of value of networking going forward. But how that worked out that year was I got a contact every month. So every month I got a phone call from uh, one of the partners or one of the GGU alums to ask, because now they were interested because this was something that was new. They said, you know, how's that working out for you there? How are you enjoying it? I tell them it's a really good experience. I'm touching all types of areas and you know, it's very fruitful. The firm's great, the people are great. And they follow up the next month. And how's that going? Is it still what you expect? And yeah, yeah, yeah. They said, I'm still kind of enjoying it. Are you regretting not going big four? I was like, nah, not at the moment. I think I feel pretty, feel pretty good about it. But it was neat to see that, you know, it's kind of as you're going through it, you're continuously giving feedback, you're learning and you're modifying. But it was one of those things that I really got to come away with this sort of appreciation. And so how the outcome of how this actually ends is that one of those GGU alums who was a partner moves up to the uh, Seattle region and uh, extends a, an opportunity to me and says, you know, it's been a year. <laughs> and I want to you to know that I'm here because he's planning to retire in region. Good guy. Uh, tremendous alum. Uh, so as you know, uh, I'd like you to consider this opportunity. So I went down to talk to his team and uh, I ultimately joined a PwC uh, a year after. Now what that did for me was from the feedback and notes I took, took from uh, those interviews from my big four sort of internship query was not, it increased my salary opportunity and it increased my trajectory in the company. So I was actually promoted faster as a result of that one year experience because I didn't come in as a new grad hire, but I came in as an experienced hire. <laughs> And so all of my fellow colleagues actually took note and I said, you know, guys, this is why we collaborate. We got to share and, and give these insights so we can make sure that we all kind of grow and leverage these, uh, these processes and learn from one another appropriately. So Dr. Rubin, that's kind of how that landed. <laughs> so you, I mean, so what I heard is that you, first of all, you, you really took initiative in learning about what was needed for the job. You didn't just take people's word that going into a big four firm was the right thing. Uh, you listened carefully, you gathered information, and ultimately you really took a big risk by going to do another firm rather than a big four, four firm, and it really ended up uh, to your benefit. So tell us a, a little bit, Robert, I know you, when you and I talked also, you talked about the rest of your career and you had kind of a series of um, things, I think a lot due to your staying in touch and communication. So if you could wrap that all up in terms of Walk us through your career and how you used your communication and networking skills. Oh, definitely. So one is, um, once I had the uh, degree in hand, my master's of science in taxation from Golden Gate, uh, you know, there's a sense of empowerment that comes with that. One is that, you know, you, you now feel like you really understand something. Because one, this is a degree that, at least in my experience, and many of my classmates at least share the sentiment, that when we finished it, not only did we feel confident, you know, to deliver tax services, at least as individuals, meaning to ourselves, family relatives, that you could literally hang a sign up and become a practitioner. And we have a host of successful GGU alums that have actually done just that, which means this is something you can do periodically through the rest of your career in life. There's others that said, you know, we're also just going to look at this opportunity to expand other areas. So each year, as I learned at Golden Gate, we did the volunteer income tax assistance program when I was there, which is kind of where you go off and help people in the, in, in, that are, you know, meet certain income restriction requirements to assist them with their tax preparation. After Golden Gate, and to this day, actually, I still participate in those programs. Uh, and why that's become so important is a, there's a sense of humbleness that goes with it. But more importantly, it's, um, it's that connection, being able to share that insight. There's still sort of this light that is just, uh, it burns, it's exciting that people appreciate when you start walking them through sort of 
the myriad of the tax rules and how they can actually become empowered to do it themselves. And I've walked mothers through it, fathers through it, the children through it, grandparents through it. And it's so amazing. Many of them actually have transcended and become Golden Gate uh, alumni. I actually have more than 40 folks actually transition to the university. In fact, we have uh, some of our adjunct professors today in the university that actually are folks that I uh, referenced and referred to the university. But these experiences are showing how it's sort of like, you know, we don't go this path alone, but we constantly make sure that we check in on one another and we support one another. Much like today, I'm having this conversation, and but I'm looking forward to also listening to the same conversations from some of those that have dialed in and others that have historically, because we all learn from one another. It's this net value proposition of network that I always kind of like really like to, to persist and share. And so as I went across and worked at sort of other institutions, from I started at PwC and then I ended up at uh, Ernst & Young, the Price Waterhouse Coopers, Washington State Society CPAs gave me a rising star award. Uh, PwC gave me this chairman's award, which is a, a recognition for, for achieving sort of great success in the firm in many ways of how they describe it. And then I moved over to this company called Ernst & Young. And as I was moving across to Ernst & Young to work in their M&A practice in DC, uh, similarly, uh, Dean Canning, uh, she was still working with Golden Gate and, uh, throughout my uh, career and then now with uh, Dean McClellan, who's just as impassioned and I'll tell you, she, she really excites you and you can see the future of, a, of an institution. Uh, they engage their alums and they go to the forums to stay cutting edge to ensure not only the value adds of the program remain aligned to not only corporate issues but practical issues, but ensuring that technology aims that keep advancing are being utilized and deployed. I mean, I'll tell you this, uh, I learned CCH, Checkpoint RA, these are all tax research databases that, you know, you learn and you get the ability to utilize in the program are no different than that they're using in the big four and elsewhere. These, these mechanisms for doing research and compliance are the training ground to then deploy and then share those insights much other grads throughout. It's just, it connects you and I'll just tell you the success continues. And so as I went across and did my M&A work over 400 due diligences that I got the chance to work on and reorgs. And as I talked about the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and many others that I got to work on in, in big sort of fashions and sort of corporate structures, I can tell you that running into a Golden Gate alum and sharing insights was a, a consideration that happened throughout. It, one benefit that came was uh, literally leaving one of the private equity firms that I was working on a deal with that was on their chairman's account in DC was the opportunity that came up to work at Walmart. Literally walked in and met the chief tax officer on the street in DC, which was, uh, met them previously at a, at a conference, noticed me there, had a conversation about potentially working in, in Bentonville. You know, and then opportunities working at American Express and all the way to, to even working at the state of Kansas where I was really championed working with the Senate Finance Committee there and got to work with so many folks in the, the Legal Services Bureau and drafting two excise tax rules that actually got enacted. It's the skills that you learn and the fashions of keeping that communication and network, I think are sort of the things I like to people to realize that these things can happen. And, you know, I'm here today to ensure that if anyone has queries questions beyond this conversation, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm definitely available and happy to share those insights. But Dr. Ruth, I know you have other questions. I'll let you. Well, well yeah, so I, I, um, I think the, how did you, what got you to the state of Kansas? Oh, and sorry. How did you end up working Working there. Yeah, yeah, so with the government. Yeah, so yeah, that was after. So my father had passed actually in uh, 2013, and one of the uh, elements of that of his passing was kind of, you know, I'm doing through probate and things of that nature, and uh, what ends up taking me to to state of Kansas is kind of through that process, and so while there, I enrolled at this uh, Washburn University School of Law. And it was a, a good experience. Uh, while there, they actually gave me the opportunity to, uh, to you know, really leverage my education to, to give you a, a sense of that. Uh, GGU already has you writing memos in their graduate tax program. So in, in law school, they actually just take sort of a, a different track, but essentially it's the same sort of outputs. And so you can really leverage the, the mechanics and frameworks that from one program to the next. And it was just a uh, great success in that respect. But the state of Kansas came in on the first week of the uh, orientation at Washburn Law. They come in, they talk to their second and third years, and this is me walking in on orientation day. And the uh, chief, uh, sort of uh, the chief of the tax department, or the uh, Kansas Legal Services Bureau for Kansas, 
came in and talked about a myriad of cases that they were working on. So they had a case with Microsoft, Google, all of these, these corporate sort of uh, interactions because they're really selling to, to the law students as potential hires or attorneys into the state. Uh, look at these opportunities that we're working on at the state of Kansas. And, you know, it's, we are, we're at the cutting edge, just like you would hear a, a myriad of uh, many different sort of state houses, but they really had some live cases. And so it was interesting to hear how he talked about it. And so as he was communicating and going through it, and, you know, I, at this point, I had quite a bit of experience in taxation. I could actually feel fairly confident to be able to raise my hand and ask some insights. You know, it's about 120 folks in the, in the, in the uh, sort of setting. And they're all sitting in there taking notes, feverishly wanting to, you know, learn more about working in the Legal Services Bureau. But as he was giving his sort of overview, I kind of raised my hand and said, you know, it's unique that you kind of took that approach in one of the cases that you described and said, did you consider these other sort of potential avenues? And it was so interesting because uh, he stopped and, you know, looked and said, you know what? Uh, looked at me and said, that was a, that was a very specific response that shows that I think you have experience in this. I was like, yeah, I said, I've had a few, you know, opportunities to engage on some of these tax topics. And then he stopped it and said, you know, for right now, and looking at everyone in the room, he said, you know, I want to give you the opportunity because I haven't done this before. And this is the, the chief uh, tax counsel lead sort of having this discussion during his overview. Says, I want to stop and extend you an opportunity to come work with us right now in the uh, Legal Services Bureau in the state of Kansas. And I said, like, well, you know, I'm, I'm working on a multitude of facets, plus I was taking some classes. But he was like, it's really important. And so I had the opportunity to actually be at law, the law school, you know, go in. They did a, it ended up being a pay sort of schedule they set up for me. But I went in and essentially started really <laughs> the opportunity to not only work on their cases that he was highlighting, I actually saw quite a few of them. But I also got the opportunity to lead this area of Farm Bureau taxation. And I tell folks that that's really something where you have to have a growth mindset and kind of moving into things. Is I ended up leading a section where, you know, they deployed new rules as an advocacy group that really championed it, but no one in the division actually really knew how to advise it. And so they had asked if I could help guide that. And so I ended up learning areas and creating sort of rules and regs to help people kind of really facilitate everyday working life in Kansas related to sort of the farm industry, because that's a really big segment. And so as I went through and helped clear out the tax cases and advocacy, as well as uh, writing a few rules for them, it was, uh, you learn that, you know, the skills that you gain, uh, they're really not only sought after, they really become a value add in many forms. But uh, yes, that's what kind of led there to Dr. Rubin, as you were highlighting. <laughs> And how, and so I think from Kansas, you ended up in, you went to Microsoft. Is that correct? Tell us about that and a little bit more about what you're doing at Microsoft. Oh, certainly. Yeah. So that was kind of interesting. So uh, Microsoft had this opportunity and I always credit my wife for this one. As my wife uh, was looking at opportunities, so it's kind of like a free agent as I'm sitting out there in Kansas. Uh, many of the folks have been trying to keep me and hire me, but you know, father had passed, I'm dealing with a lot there. So they were being sensitive to it. But the same token, as uh, I started querying about opportunities, I had a lot of interest, which was a positive thing. And so I didn't take that for granted. It was something to be cherished. And my wife kind of highlighted that uh, she turns to me, and, and Natasha's her name. And I'll tell you this. She's also an alum, by the way, of Golden Gate. She did a EMPA. Just to show you the infectious of a degree, even in the household, she uh, completed hers. And to this day, uh, it's, it's proved very well in paying dividends. But she uh, noted it because we're both from Alaska, as you kind of highlighted about my mother going from Selma to Alaska. We were both born there. I was born there as well as my wife. And one of the uh, elements was leaving Kansas. She said, you know, let's look, you got a lot of opportunities in front of you. But think about something, you know, that might be particularly up in the Pacific Northwest for family purposes, you know, your mother and all of them and Alaska. And so I said, yeah, that's interesting. So they had a role available uh, with a number of companies up here. I didn't want to really at the time uh, work with certain organizations in the region. I'll just put it that way. Uh, not for, for reasons known, but I said I kind of understood colleagues working in certain work environments. And, but uh, Microsoft had this opportunity, which was really kind of cutting edge, surprisingly. It was a, a senior program manager in the audit group that oversaw sort of a tax and trade oversight function. It was uh, what caught my attention about it wasn't just my wife bringing it to my attention, but it was also the fact that it was the only role of its kind that existed in a corporate setting. And so I said, this is uh, fairly interesting. And so as I looked at the opportunity, I said, uh, this is uh, 
unique. It didn't make sense because it required a broad lens, which, you know, as I talked about, as you go to Big Four, they track folks. I managed to kind of create sort of a broader lens for myself, which I kind of think is unique, but I always realized that that was not the, not the norm. So when I looked at the role, I said, you know, if you're trying to attract the not the norm candidates, right, I, this one came to me in a very abnormal fashion to be my wife, but in general, I couldn't see a deep applicant pool. So I was kind of curious about it. We had conversations. Uh, Microsoft essentially just said, look, you're the candidate for the role, and they brought me in. Now, the success in the role and how I actually got to build that up, it's uh, still running. I got to stand the function of its oversight role. It really gives us a lot of sort of uh, compliance assurances, at least from a, an internal audit perspective. It now sits in our audit risk compliance team. But uh, even the success that came out of it led to me coming into this tax and trade controller role, actually. And so they transitioned to kind of now run the oversight within the team itself. And so it's sort of like you take certain risks and they're all calculated in aggregation, meaning all these experiences that I had, they all kind of really build toward where I am today. Meaning that, you know, we should always be very mindful that, you know, as every experience we take really gives us an opportunity to really uh, fulfill something that sometimes we don't actually know what it is yet. And uh, so that's kind of what the unique sort of overall kind of experience that kind of leads me here. Yeah, let me know, Dr. Rubin. Yeah, 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 no, yes, yeah, so fascinating. So if you could, you know, you've had, again, a remarkable career. Definitely. So, you know, if you could um, articulate, what, what do you think is the mindset that's um, contributed to your success? Oh, certainly. It's funny. It's uh, Microsoft used this term that I, I didn't know of, but it's been around, I guess, for many years. It's our CEO mantra. Uh, a few on the call kind of know it, like Catherine Larson, if she's on as you know, we have growth mindset. This this cult, this sort of ideology that uh, Carol Dweck drafted. She's a Stanford professor, and uh, she's done uh, a lot of research in area that's really child development. And so our CEO Satya Nadella, actually his wife uh, the new gave it to him to actually read dealing with their family and children, and he saw the parity and said, you know, there's there's a lot of value here in the corporate setting, you know, for how he looked at our tech sort of company and saying that, you know, this is something that can really change and transcend how we all think, because he's really trying to upend the culture. And in order to really do that from the top, he really pushed this concept of growth mindset. You know, and that just really means that, uh, or at least to, to give people a sense of it, it means you don't set a bar of saying like, you know, I just, uh, I'm getting an A grade and everything is wonderful. And so they did this, uh, Carol's studies, she went around and realized that if people, students, Great, like for fail became a mental stopping point. And so they no longer wanted to proceed forward. And the person who was given the A, well, then they needed another topic or item in order to drive them, meaning it wasn't self-motivated. They're not going to continue. And her studies took her to the, the Chicago where they refused to give an F grade. They put down not yet on the paper of the students. And she said that the outcome was tremendous. And that by putting that, it almost sits this mindset that failure is essential to success that you need to take those risks and that, that enables it. And so by not actually putting an upgrade, but putting not yet and thinking holistically about, you know, intellectual curiosity, the one will actually continue to actually perform so much farther than a person who just focuses on the A grade. And so we've created that culture at Microsoft and it's unique because innately my mother is one that we'll talk about kind of really inhabited a lot of those underpinnings and her resiliency and her, and her sort of life story as well as my father. And so as I had those, I kind of see now that that mindset, we all reference it now, it's growth mindset today, you know, the sense of resiliency. And I think they kind of run uh, parallel to themselves. So why don't, tell us about your mom. I know there's been, um, there's been so much in the news um, lately about Black Lives Matter and racial inequality. And you have, your mom sounds like a, a real pioneer. So tell us about her, a little bit about her story and how that's inf influenced you. Oh, indeed. Yes, no, the, 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 the unfortunate necessities of, of what we've heard today with like Black Lives Matter and a lot of the movements, you know, they're not, they originated in many respects to the Brown v. Board education. It was the abolishment of the separate but equal doctrine from the Supreme Court that had run for many years up to 1954. And so as the, all of a sudden have this sort of mass desegregation in America in the 50s, uh, a lot of people don't know what that means. It changes, right? We had signs up that essentially said, you know, Blacks only, whites only. It was very clear and distinct. And so during this period, 55 years ago, in fact, uh, from, from this year, 
uh, my mother was a teenager uh, with her you know, brother at the time and joined sort of the, the Bloody Sunday movement. And fortunately, it's not a, a great title to have, but uh, John Lewis, as we know, who recently passed, an iconic figure, and one of the trailblazers uh, from the freedom writers of the, of the era, as well as uh, Cordell Tindall, CT, who also passed during the same time. They uh, were people that she had the opportunity to interact with, as well as the, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King as well. And she often tells these insights and shares them with others. And, but what happened that day on Bloody Sunday was kind of uh, the original sort of unfortunate beginnings of broadcast sort of brutalities that uh, were marked on TV. In this instance, it was the police and how they kind of unfortunately didn't want to allow groups to have sort of the, the ability just to walk and literally protest silently. And that we're trying to protest and walk across the bridge and, and that was met with a, a level of violence that unfortunately still resonates today in so many fashions. You know, there are benefits and avenues that now exist and but it was her resiliency that I think that came from that that really is something that like feeds me today. I'll let you know about that is that during that era as desegregation occurred and she and you mentioned she went to a college down there, the Lutheran College, where she was doing her licensed practical nursing. She had a professor that, you know, didn't really focus on, you know, necessarily the merits of the student, their academic abilities and achievements. It was still in their minds. It was very black white. And so she went through the struggles of, you know, having to repeat a course because of her professor uh, not accepting sort of her knowledge base, but it was more of their staunch position that, you know, he never passed a person of color before. And so when she actually finally passed after repeating this course, she said, you know, she was ready for a change. And so this is the part of resiliency where I talk about we can adapt toward conflicts and uncertainty, but still see hope. Uh, she said, you know, I'm going to go north. And so for some, north meant, you know, could have been Kansas City, could have been New York, could have been California. Uh, they were like, no, north. And so for her, north was the north is most state in, in the U.S., so in Alaska. And so uh, she went all the way up to Anchorage, Alaska, drove herself which is uh, still a story in itself. And many of her friends and, and, and relatives still talk about it to this day. But uh, she rolled at the University of Alaska Anchorage where she finished her undergraduate degree and later got a PhD. Uh, but really it's just showing that sense of self-worth, value, even in, you know, there's gonna be a lot of folks that aren't gonna support us and support people in general. And they're gonna struggle with the respect to that category. But, uh, you know, we still continue forward as best we can and remain hopeful that change can happen and that we can be change agents as we go. So she sounds like a remarkable woman and 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 she sounds like she's also had a profound influence on you and and your mindset. Oh indeed. indeed. Yeah. Uh, she's just tremendous. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. So you know and um be, before we open it up for questions, I, I wanted to ask you, since I oversee a master's in leadership here at Golden Gate, um, what, are, what do you think are some leadership tips for success? What do you think makes a good leader based on your own experience and what you've seen from others? Oh, indeed. No, if, uh, one thing I definitely wanted to leverage in, in the setting is the value proposition of networking. And I want to highlight um, uh, one particular touch point that I had at Golden Gate, which was uh, pre to the interview dates that we had for, our, for when all the employers were coming in. Me and two colleagues were on an elevator and they were prepping, thinking about, you know, how are we gonna go about these interviews the next day? So many employers they saw on the list. And, and uh, a lady who passed this year uh, back in May, but was a uh, profound and luminous uh, GGU alum, Kit Yarrow. Uh, my first touch point with her was uh, on that elevator a day before, this was back in 2004. But she's on the elevator and we said, oh, and that's Kit Yarrow. She was uh, renowned for, you know, many different topics. She's a psychologist who did great things. But when she got on the elevator, I said, let's leverage this as an opportunity to ask an outside opinion. And so Kit was really impressive because show you how well and established uh, uh, these GGU professors are like Dr. Ruby. She, she literally heard us say that, you know, we're preparing for interviews the next day. How should we think about this uh, this, this process, and I kind of just poised that to her because I said, we're all thinking about it strategically differently. And she said, you know, this concept of core four, and she, we were like, core four? She's like, yes, you need to know that you have four key people in your network that are not only going to help you learn more, help you do more, but going to help you exceed. And she gave out this concept. There was the promoter, the person who actually staunchly kind of advocates for your success, uh, this crew member, which is a person that is 
understand you're going to have some challenges, but they're going to keep you on the right path and they're going to help you learn from those mistakes that occur. Uh, she talked about uh, uh, when it was the promoter, the uh, crew member, oh, the influencer, which was because uh, that was all three of us that she was pointing. And the influencer was the person that it was your kind of accountability advocate, the person that says, yes, whatever you're going to do, you got to realize that you're accountable for it. And then she turned to herself and said, and you need to have a teacher. And the teacher is the person that's going to help you learn more. They role model behaviors that you want to be like. And why this matters is because she said, if you constantly interact with each person that you talk with and you look for constantly seeking who's your promoter, your crew member, your influencer, and your teacher, because they're going to change throughout your career, but you're looking to fill people into these sort of particular segments that you'll constantly have a network of success because you always have a touch point of people that you can work with and help you guide forward. And she said, if you look at the interviews that way, it's not just a one day touch point of learning these individuals, but it actually becomes a relationship of networking that you can leverage prospectively throughout your careers. So that was one that came out of that conversation I'd like to share with others. Wow, that, was, that sounds like a profound interaction that um, it was. <laughs> it has stayed with you. So um, Priscilla, why don't we um, open a, up for questions now? Yes, there weren't any questions in the chat, but I know that there are a few students on the line. So please, students, don't feel uh, too shy to unmute yourselves and ask a question or type a question to the chat. We have a question from Doris Duncan, who is an alum of GGU. What are the tax implications of Microsoft purchasing TikTok? Oh, that's a great query. As we know, this is a unique one. This is uh, not one I can really speak to because we don't actually own them. But uh, under CFIS, they have an Export Control Reform Act of 2018. They've created this, uh, this rule where the United States actually reviews any foreign acquisitions and foreign meaning any company that's not based in the U.S. for purposes of security, national security risk purpose assessments. And so out of that is how sort of this perspective TikTok purchase kind of surfaces to the, where we all know about it. <laughs> so CFIS does their sort of review and uh, our president has openly commented on it. Our CEO, Sasha Nadella, certainly commented on it. And uh, I think at this stage, we know that they've been set key deadlines and dates and we'll see how that actually goes. So for that, I can't really speak to, to the TikTok specifically because I don't have the fact patterns of you know what are their tax attributes and footprint and so forth. Uh, we do have awareness just like where they operate based on what the news gives us, but there's so much more to an organization. And what I mean by that, so those that are interested in tax and those who, who haven't, you start to see the world in a different lens. You're like, hey, there's an organization, but you start learning there's a myriad of legal entities that make up that corporate structure. And they have many different sort of obligations as a result of that structure. And so as we learn those insights, it really helps feed sort of what uh, the type of response that when we get to that answer. So I can't actually answer that at the moment, but I think we'll all wait and see what actually happens. <laughs> so thank you, Doris. Thank you. We have a question from Jenny Lang, an alum. Do you recommend a tax professional in early career stage to go into M&A before moving, in, moving to industry? In other words, what did you define as the most useful experience in public accounting? Oh, certainly. Yeah, so public accounting gives uh, the sense of governance is what I definitely say is the takeaway. Uh, the structured approach of being able to not only collaborate with colleagues and being able to sort of really scrutinize potential opportunities or positions that ones are, are taking. And when I say that for those on the line, if a person, if you or I, any of us decide not to file a tax return in a given year, that's a position we've taken. Now, if we work for a corporation or if we're advising, then we actually got to memorialize that position with some level of uh, support, either tax court, tax law, or some types of cases, primary authority, to help kind of speak to the positions that we take. And there's many reasons that people would do that. And so uh, the question is a sort of learning how we look at all of those types of scenarios in a public big four setting or a public accounting setting gives you the sense of, okay, this is how I look at it. The person that you have as sort of your net reviewer is the person who's going to give initial feedback toward how you would actually first assess it. And then you sort of have some sort of senior level reviewer who actually then comes in and, and reconciles any differences or proposals. That framework of thinking uh, carries one throughout their entire career, I'd definitely say that, is it transcends industries. 
uh, many organizations, uh, those basic lines of having evidence of review and documenting these things roll up into surveillance Oxley of the world and all types of sort of tax transparency initiatives today through OECD. It's, our, uh, organ uh, it's the Organization of Economic Cooperation Development. It's an international work that kind of sets tax transparency globally. They set a lot of initiatives based on just these constructs. So something as simple as, you know, the value of the review process and how we store our information transcends to all of these settings. So meaning that, yes, the, the value that you get every day, uh, you will take it for granted sometimes, but uh, it's actually each day's lessons that you're engaging on are definitely building toward uh, success for you down the road. And in terms of the, the m and piece, uh, if you have the opportunity to work in a, an m and session in the, in the big four, I think that definitely gives a, a lot of value uh, because you often get to see sort of different structures uh, partnership structures, S corp structures, uh, joint ventures. Uh, you work on things that you know most don't actually get the opportunity to see, and that can carry you in industry because then you can bring those insights. So definitely recommend seeing if you can do a rotation in M&A if you're not a role. But uh, I think each day you're you're definitely driving value. Thank you, Robert. We have some practitioners, practitioners, and students on the line. From your work at Microsoft, what emerging trends do you see that our students should be particularly uh, keen to, to learn while they're still at GTU? Oh, definitely. Uh, I will definitely say this, and it's not just to, to say Microsoft, but I'll say technology, uh, meaning that, yes, at Microsoft, you know, a known product is Excel. You can use many different factors and forms, but uh, learning how to have comfort with using technology, uh, Tableau, uh, Power BI, visual galleries, how to display, parse, and do these sort of executive purviews, uh, data analytics, uh, to show how you can handle large amounts of data and parse it for, for decision-making purposes. Uh, if you think about those types of aspects, I think that's something that can be great value. In terms of specifics, I've shared some with Dina McClellan, if you'd like to ask her, I know she's already aware. As she uh, came on site, was in my office a few months back, and she even actually interacted with quite a few folks here. It's, there was some uh, discussion about even ways that we could help drive sort of that experience for GGU. So more than willing to talk further and help you if necessary. Thank you. Yes, we, we are um, starting in a, a concentration data analytics in our accounting and tax program. So <laughs> thank I love, you. I love it. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I want to once again just invite students to type in your questions. Don't be shy. I have a question in, be, in between. So what, um, Robert, what advice would you give to anyone considering um, or, or thinking about an MS in taxation? What advice would you give? Oh, to oh certainly. It's, uh, if you are thinking about the graduate degree in tax at Golden Gate, I will say it opens you up to a pretty broad uh, network of individuals. So much like the queries that uh, I received here, on the call about, you know, tracks and, and timing. Don't make it a one-time query. Uh, part of sort of that uh, component I got from Kit and that I'm sharing with you about building out that network core four. Make sure you have that teacher, that promoter, that crew person, that influencer, and you're constantly querying and, and asking those questions. So that way it's uh, GGU has so many alums that are willing to fill that bucket, any one of them, uh, that you can actually continuously get that feedback to iteratively get better and improve and, and literally be extreme success to the point that you're giving similar insights or sharing your tidbits in ways that I think would influence many. But I think uh, an MS tax at Golden Gate is still today, the value remains strong. Uh, we have so many individuals that are still taking the courses and what amazes me today is attorneys, uh, people who graduated from other institutions, they're still taking classes because they need to understand the concepts that GGU is one of the few universities that offer those courses in those areas. So just tidbits for those who are thinking about it. Thank you. We have a question from one of our faculty. Um, how will AI and ML impact professionals' use of canned software such as Microsoft Office? Oh, certainly. Yeah, no, I think uh, the benefits are, and we've actually started using it with our, our cloud services. Our cloud product is called Azure, A-Z-U-R-E. And it has this edge component. And so there's elements there we've created like data lakes and, and flows. And for those that don't go into that level of technical depth, we created what's called a power platform or power automate. And what these do is if you use power automate, it's low code or no code that enables sort of to the, the query 
uh, the ability to, to attach workflows and automations to your daily work product right now. So you can actually do it to kind of create. You start thinking about your control frameworks a bit differently because now you can automate a lot of it. So you have to kind of think about your inputs and outputs. But these products are already available and people are using them. And we've seen a, a, a pretty significant adoption rate, at least across the industry. Thank you. And a follow up to that question. What technical skills do you recommend that tax professionals should invest time in? In other words, what trends in corporate tax are you seeing that weighs more these years? Oh, certainly. Yes, the understanding of uh, just uh, the ETL, we have uh, extract uh, transact load sort of databases. We've used so many types of Alteryx platforms and these Power Automate platforms like I'm, I'm highlighting. If you use or have awareness to these types of things, I think they would really uh, prove great value. So in other words, have comfort the, just using the technology, but also just realize that, you know, again, there's no wrong approach, but just showing that growth mindset toward adoption, you know, so yeah, let me log in and try it. If anyone's interested or hasn't actually utilized them before, there are free forms. On LinkedIn, we do a, a digital services initiative. So if you log on to LinkedIn and actually have that, you can click through. It's a free sort of insights and learnings that we offer online to everyone that you can click and look and see how a lot of these technologies operate. And they give you sort of nice, uh, nice modules that you can see in action and some of the learnings you can develop uh, going forward if you want certifications and so forth. Thank you, Robert. A really interesting question. Um, how relevant do you consider your tax, um, excuse me, your law school education to your tax career and why? Oh, certainly. Uh, much like the, the MBA and much like the MS operations and much like the grad, each one are all post Golden Gate. So everything I did, for master's in tax one, the grad, first grad degree was Golden Gate University. The others are really uh, things I took, I took advantage of in the different corporate settings. What I mean by that is sort of if you have people that are willing to help pay for opportunities, leverage them, uh, big four paid for academic stuff for me as well. Using the different settings as ways to I could actually document my learnings on a go forward measure. And what it does in terms of the, the query uh, in respect to law and MS taxes, law is general. It shows you how to operate sort of in general courts of jurisdiction versus, you know, your state courts and, and getting into civil matters and understanding those distinctions and disparities. There's a criminal law element. Whereas uh, Golden Gate really is civil. It's really just dealing with sort of the taxation elements of it. You're not really getting in there unless the penalties of a particular jurisdiction rise to criminal sort of warrants that level of, uh, of query. And so having the two, it's sort of like if one wants to just think general and, you know, and I want to understand just becoming sort of an advocate potentially. And again, there's a cost element between the two if people are thinking. But if you know you definitely want to be a tax practitioner and thinking of a story career where one can just work and literally to, to retirement, that's the mess tax in my mind. I always tell folks that and I always share it because I think that I can do it. But at the same token, one can certainly have a fruitful career as everyone knows a lot. Thank you. Another question is about networking. What advice do you have for those who are early in their professional career and are trying to network virtually during the COVID-19 era? Definitely. I think uh, it's actually a good time to network, believe it or not. So the COVID era actually introduced people of uh, getting familiar with using online tools and formats. Zoom, MS, uh, Microsoft has a Teams platform. There's so many ways that we're all now interacting. And it really took these last three to four months for adoption to really kick in, where people started realizing that, you know, this isn't a sprint, but it's a marathon. They thought, hey, I'll just try to bear with it. But once you realize that this is going to keep going, you got to hunker down at some point. And I'm realizing more and more colleagues, that at least I talk with, are taking calls. Uh, I'm going to be uh, talking at, the, uh, at a, a conference in, in the next couple of months, actually. It was in person. They transitioned to uh, a virtual format. Quite a few of the trainings that are out there that they're offering for CPE also have moved to a virtual format. And what that has done is it's enabled more people to realize that, you know, we need to start booking time. And they're doing 15, 15 minute and 30 minute meetings, I mean, a multitude of short meetings, just to sync with people on various topics. And because they want to try to change things up, they want, they, many folks are welcoming the opportunity to do networking, even if it's to kind of have an informational or a sync and leverage platforms such as LinkedIn, reach out to people that you can kind of work on professional networks and say, do you have a few moments just to talk about a, if it's the area of interest, or if you just want to learn more about someone's career endeavors. I think uh, this is the time to really maximize its use and realize that you can get a lot of value out of it. 
Thank you. And it looks like it's going to be the last question from our audience. These are all really great questions. Thank you. The last question we have for today, do you find corporate business decisions being made based on tax consequences or is revenue really the main driver in these decisions and tax considerations are just an inconvenient truth? Oh, tell me about it. Isn't that the age old adage? You know, it's uh, think about Ben Franklin. He's the one who said there's only two certainties in life, right? Death and taxes. And then another famous person that we all know, Albert Einstein actually quotes on the IRS website, the hardest thing to understand, and this is Einstein, is the income tax. No, it's, uh, so when you think about the business and how things are occurring, without a doubt, it's the business-led motions. Uh, tax folks are usually on the back end, and what that means is that they're, they're not truly tax-motivated decisions. There are many people that are thinking that those can happen, and that's why we have this wonderful structure called our Internal Revenue Service that helps manage any instances where we think that people are doing tax avoidance. But yes, uh, to, the, to the extent of how we all live our lives and have to pay taxes daily, uh, that inconvenience or, or uniqueness that enables sort of our federal economies and state economies, yes, we are all unfortunately taxpayers, but yes, those decisions are led by the business uh, primarily. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. And with that, on behalf of the entire Golden Gate University community, Marsha, Robert, thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to listen to this very intriguing conversation about, about your, your career and how GGU has impacted uh, your, your life. Thank you so much, Robert. No, thank you, and thank you to everyone. It was a great uh, conversation. And again, reach out to LinkedIn and happy to talk with you further. Thank you. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Robert. For me. So, so impressive and a delight to talk with. Oh, thank you, Dr. Rubin. I appreciate your time as well as everyone else's. Hey, have a good day. You too. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.